If you want to be an artist, like know that it's in you. It's like a part of you. It's, it's a necessity. There's it's like a no need. Option. There's no other option. Yeah. There's no other option, and you give up everything. If you're willing to give up everything to follow this path, then go for it 100%. And if you just like making things on the side, just do that too. Like, there's no fucking rules, but stay on the grind and keep pushing your work. Don't settle, like keep trying to like outdo yourself. Like you should always be in a battle with yourself as if you were the dragon that you need to slay. Hi, welcome back to Chris Dyer's Creative Friends, a super awesome podcast YouTube show where me, your artist friend Chris Dyer, talks to his super awesome creative artistic friends. Today I got Mike Maxwell. <laughs> That's <laughs> I'm so cheesy, intro. sorry. <laughs> We're in San Diego area and I'm painting around and uh, yeah, I was like, hey, let's go and catch up with Mike, who's an old friend. We've known each other for what, like 10 years Over at least? 10 years now, yeah. Yeah, totally. So, um, where are we right now? Um, we are in Carlsbad, California at the Nixon Watches headquarters. Nice. I'm, uh, I'm painting a big mural project here as they're getting everything moved into this new space. It's beautiful, man. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, how long will this mural take you? Um, I'm about two weeks of painting in right now. Nice. Um, I, it's a mix between brush and spray paint? Yeah. Um, mostly acrylic and brush work, um, a little bit of spray paint too. Nice. Yeah. What's, uh, how much do you mural? Is that like a, a thing you do much or is it more lately? Um, I've always done it. Um, and it's like few and far between. Like I'm, I, I, but this year, for some reason, um, I've done like three or four and it's like back to back consecutive. Nice. And it's, it's not always something I go searching out for. Mm -hmm. um, it's usually like random meetings with people or friends of friends or I know a company that is doing things like um, it's really random the guy who's one of the art directors here I actually worked with at Black Market in 99 okay so he had just started working here recently and um, they had I guess they had like a list of different artists that they were considering they wanted somebody local um, who's been in the industry for a while. And um, I happened to fall on the list, I guess. And um, my buddy Grant, who's helping facilitate the project, is like, wait, I know that guy. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like serendipitous in a way. Like, and, you know, there's almost like a sort of like a laziness to it almost. In, not in, even in a negative context, but it's like. For murals? Uh, like how they come about. Oh, okay. It's like, I'm not out marketing. The, uh, I mean, I guess if you post anything, it ends up being marketing, right? Like if you show the world that you do something, it ends to up... To some degree, how hard you're trying, how yeah. often you're posting, what are you posting? So it just so happens that I got hit up and ended up working out time-wise and project-wise. And I've been lucky enough that like, the people I've been working with are super cool. Everyone's like open to letting me do what I do and... Um, not putting the, the handcuffs on me too much so mm -hmm. it's been good yeah nice do, do like murals i know in your case i know in my case but in your case do murals pay a little bit better than say selling paintings or doing a graphic yeah i mean because it's a typically because it's like a chunk of time usually right um and it's it more often than not you know it's it's for a brand you know, mm -hmm. it's like it's doing something for them versus it's commercial. The, the, yeah, the difference between which I mean, selling art is still commercial, but so often like we're making these pieces of art that we don't know who it's going to. We don't know who's going to like it or what like what realm it's going to fall into. Typically, like a gallery world or something, and it's sold on a different way. And it's like 
I, this is, I think, more about like for the people that work here in a way. Mm -hmm. um, Just to make their environment pleasant or do you think they'll yeah, do their yeah, own yeah. podcast interview we're, back we're time lapsing the mural and I went back and I looked through the photos uh -huh. and saw like this blank corner wall at the start of it and like the difference in feeling from all the color, the imagery and you know, it like really gives you a different sense of environment. So, right, um, art uplift the soul. Right, and so it seems like a lot of, I, like businesses that I've been working with and it's like, you know, a lot of times it's private owned businesses and that sort of thing. They're, they're noticing more that having an environment like this is conducive to a better workplace, maybe a better business flow, a better environment for your customers, et cetera. So mm -hmm. um, this last year I've been doing a bunch. Nice. Um, but yeah, it's usually, it was like around like one a year, two a year, or something like that. Or if there was a project, uh, like a, an event or something. But um, yeah, I have another one to do in Denver. Oh, cool. Um, at some point, uh, once I get done with this too. So. Nice, Denver's yeah. awesome. Yeah, I, I went, uh, when I was a teenager, I was there, but I haven't been as an adult. So. Uh -huh. Botkin was just there doing a mask thing. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Yeah, at the end of last month, and I hooked him up with some of my Denver friends because I go there quite a bit. Yeah, nice. My brand's are based there. Um, so I don't expect you to know much about Nixon, but is it like an artistic kind of brand? Uh, um, as, yeah, I, they've worked with a bunch of like really good artists in the past. Um, and I know it's, it's, they're connected to like the outdoor surf, skate, snowboard action like, sports action sports realm mm -hmm. and music too they're really involved in in with musicians and things like that um so it's kind of it's it's a pretty natural fit yeah that's one of the like the sweet things of living in this area right right yeah like yeah, all mean, the action the sports. it's yeah. really the hub like yeah. surfing skateboarding etc is all in this so-called not all of it but a lot of it right yeah a lot of it is housed here and you know it was born here in a way mm -hmm. um so it's nice. So I, I feel like those types of mindsets, whether you you are involved in these action sports or not, like it turns out like there's a lot. I feel like there's a lot of similar mentalities um, to arts and creativity in all these realms. Because really, I mean, all these action sports are creativity in their own realm. You know, it's right learning new things, learning new tricks, like making your body move a certain way it's problem solving mm -hmm. which is i always say art is creative problem solving and i think people who are doing these types of sports are doing the exact same thing so i think it triggers the same like endorphin release the same uh, similar like mental reaction to the process totally uh, and i and i think that maybe even if you're not involved in those sports or if the people in the sports are not involved in the arts there's a cohesiveness there that allows people to understand it in that way, whether it's conscious or not, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, that's awesome that you, you're from here and you continue to live here. I'm actually like considering to move to this area because Canada is getting so COVID restrictive. Yeah. And uh, I'm just like, I don't know if I want to go to a place where I'm not allowed to do anything. Meanwhile, I'm hanging out here, and just by being here, hanging out with skater friends, I'm getting jobs in different board brands, and you know, just things are popping up here. Yeah. So I'm just like, well, like if I lived here, even though it's expensive, at least I'd have fun jobs to do. Yeah. Um, so, what do you love and dislike about San Diego? Like I know I asked you this last time I was here, like 2013. Um, you say that you like the weather. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, that's the obvious choice. Um, it's like always sunny. Yeah, nonstop. You know, we get we get an occasional cloud here and there, but um, I mean, it is one of the benefits. The actual geography is like one of the major benefits. I mean, uh, just last week got to get in the ocean. It was like seventy-two degrees. A seal came swimming up to us. Um, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things. It, it, and, you know, it's kind of weird over this last year because before, before COVID, you know, I was going out all the time and partying or whatever. And the last year and a half, I spent most of the time just hanging out inside, which I'm fine with. I don't, like, it doesn't matter to me. Um, but it's made it to where 
you're not doing as much stuff in the city, so you're not really paying attention to like what makes it good in terms of whether it be entertainment or anything, you know. Um, Is that a good thing or a bad thing? For me, it's neutral. It didn't. It didn't really matter one way or the other. Um, and I think I could be jaded because I've been here for 42 years. You know, I moved away for short stints of time and came back. But um, are you 42? You just turned 42. Yeah. Okay, nice. I'm 42 also. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there's a jadedness because it's like this is not new to me. Yeah. But I, I I can put myself in other people's shoes and think, wow, this must be like amazing. Because you know, like I could go to Georgia and drive down a street and be like, wow, look at this tree. Oh my God, this is so beautiful. Look at this lush green, mm -hmm. you look know, woods architecture. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> just be fascinated. But if you drive by that same tree and those that same architecture for weeks, months on end, it it's has weird. less of a sheen. It's just the mm -hmm. nature of things. Um, so for me to be, I, I find, and I'm a bit of a pessimist too, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> like I, I have a tendency to look at what irritates me uh -huh. more so than what gives me joy. Because the That's sense of irritation is, <laughs> I, was, I was getting ready for that in the car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's there, it's there. And, you know, I could be honest with, uh, with myself about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, it's me. Um, so, uh, you know, I might look at things a little glass half empty sometimes. And there's, there's uh, particularly in the art community, like, there isn't a whole ton of support for the arts in this town. Oh, no way. A majority of the money in this town is conservative, right? So with that comes some challenges. Mm -hmm. um, if a group of people are typically not the type who are putting money into the arts um, in this level, you know, maybe they're buying Andy Warhols and, you know, shit at Christie's and shit. But... You know, they're not doing much for the local working artists. Mm -hmm. um, and I see it all the time. Like, like you could go into a gallery in San Diego and see there be a painting for $1,000. And somebody who could afford it is going to be like, what the fuck? Like, that's a crazy price. Like, what is going on here? And then you could go just two, mo two hours north to L.A. And maybe somebody who can't quite afford it will be like, yeah, that's a reasonable price. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's and it's a perception thing, and I I've tried I think in some way to open up that visual perception for a larger group of people through my own work and the things that I've done to kind of help facilitate uh, an arena where it's like people's minds aren't blown because somebody needs a thousand dollars for something that took them two weeks to make. You know, no one would scoff their nose at somebody like saying, oh, I worked 80 hours and, you know, this amount per hour and here's what I get. And be like, yeah, that makes sense. But when it comes to the arts in a broad majority of the population and, you know, this could be the same everywhere. I, I only know my perspective here, but I see it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, com comparing any city to Los Angeles or New York or San Francisco tends to have some fatal flaws in the comparison just because you expect something to be like somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But I've made the joke, I forget, that there's a, a, a really well-known respected art critic um, that writes on the East Coast somewhere, and I'm not gonna remember the name, but we had made some comment about, um, he was like, making art in San Diego, you might as well be making art in Wisconsin, or you know, you could be anywhere, in the, essentially. Um, but then back to the, you know, some sort of sense of positivity, these realms of these arenas where people appreciate artwork, um, you have to find those, you got, you got to find those places, maybe be a little bit more of um, an explorer in a way mm -hmm. than say, you know, if you're in New York, obviously you just start hitting galleries and because that's the avenue. But here you're you're lucky to find a gallery to stay open for any particular amount of time and really build up a clientele and mm -hmm. you know but i guess once again it's about looking about those niches that would appreciate art like yeah the action sports people the stoners uh even beer, beer brewing is humongous here it's like oh, cool. another one of these hubs 
mm -hmm. um, these industries. But then, then again, as an artist, you're, you're not really, I mean, I feel like most of us are not really that interested in brand. Um, Hunting? Yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> and so, like there's something a little kind of gross about it. Right. You know, that you're, oh, I'm just a, a fucking marketing tool. Right. When most of us want to sit down in our studio and paint and have people buy what it is that we made mm -hmm. with our heart and our minds and right. our hands, you know. But I guess um, like, you know, like, for example, you like jujitsu. That's like right. your thing. Maybe there's a scene for that here. There was, yeah. I got a ton of support. And mm -hmm. like, I have probably 15 gyms that have my art up in and there's that the mural in Denver is a jujitsu gym. Oh, cool, nice. So it's like, and that's what I mean. It's like, okay, here's these niches of people who are doing creative problem solving in their own realm, which jujitsu is the same exact thing. Um, having this appreciation for visual arts that um, allows them to to want to put their money into it, you mm -hmm. know. And support it in whichever ways they they know how or they can, you know, totally. and that's great. And you know, I think, as an artist in an area that maybe isn't saturated with the money that goes into the arts, you you have to find these these avenues if you want to keep working, if you want to keep the lights on. You know? Is there like a ton of artists here, or not so many because of that lack of work? Well, I, I definitely think there would be more, you know, if there was a revenue stream for them to, to pull from. Um, I, and, you know, we're in an age now where you literally could be anywhere and sell something online, take it to the post office and ship and do all that. Right. Um, so that does take away a little bit of that burden. Um, but, yeah, I, I do, I, you know, the more food, the more, the more consumption there would be you know what i mean right. so well say I like mean, montreal there, there's like a ton of artists and it makes it that i get i never get any new work in my own city because there's just too many talented artists yeah and that's fine i don't mind traveling but uh but that also there's something to be said about that too is it steps up everybody's game too that's true right like if if you're in a town full of killers you better be a killer too right um and the flip side of that coin if you're in a town where there aren't that many killers, okay, maybe you could be a big fish in a little pond, but who's challenging you? Right. You know? And of course, like all these things, it's perspective, whether you're, you know, stuck in your little city and only paying attention to that or on a global, worldwide, you know, spectrum. Right. So. Totally. Um, so we know each other for like around 10 years now. Last time I was here, I visited, well, I was here painting a couple of murals. I painted something at Seedless. We yeah. hanged out. But we actually know each other from before. Do you remember where, where, when we met? Yeah, we met in Miami. Uh-huh. Because all the Canadian boys and one gal came to San Diego um, before that. Okay, the uh, Ed Mass crew. Yeah, and we, we did a project. That there was a San Diego art fair which isn't happening anymore, you know, back to my point. <laughs> um, well, maybe it is, it's just not on the radar. And then maybe a few months after that, we went to Miami. Right. It's, it's been a while since I've been out there. That place is so wild. Yeah, you never And went that's a lot of mural work too, right? Right. Yeah. But that's like for free. Like you're just promoting yourself yeah, out yeah, there in yeah. Miami. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was super fun. Like, I went there for, like, some visionary event, but then it was like, oh, my mass friends, Jason Bodkin and Before Real and Melissa, etc. cetera, we were all painting, and you were painting with them. And yeah. you guys had, like, this sweet, uh, what, hotel room on top of a building on a very high yeah, rise. I crashed that spot. I, that, but, that, wasn't my, <laughs> that wasn't my planning. But you were part of the view uh, yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, I was. That yeah. was fun, and I, I just loved hanging out with you guys more than, like, my visionary friends. <laughs> That was an amazing trip, man. Yeah. I, I mean, it had a real, like, it had an old feel to it. Like, it felt like the 90s to me, in a way. It was very rootsy, running around in bikes, painting yeah. anything you could. Yeah. That wall we were painting was, like, Wynwood was more ghetto back in 2011. And yeah. It was kind of sketchy, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, I feel, that's, it's funny, like, I, when people ask about Florida and Miami, I'm like, I fucking love Miami. Mm -hmm. And, like, all these neighborhoods, I talk about the little little Cuban restaurant right. got shut down because the sons were selling cocaine out of it. Oh. Um, but, uh, but I don't have the perspective of Miami 
outside of that chunk of two, three weeks in December, right? Like, right. I would, so I don't know. But yeah, I mean, it definitely was sketchy. Um, I know there were spots where it's like, all right, when you're riding the bike through this section, like, haul ass. But I, you know, that might be all perception too, right? Like, totally. I have, and you haven't been back. Like, you, do you still feel like promoting yourself in those circles? Are you kind of just comfortable with, with, with where you're at? Um, I would. You know, um, the la- I went out there. Um, shit. When, must be around like 20... 13 2014 was the last time I was out mm-hmm. me and um Deffer painted uh, a brewery um just outside of Wynwood um and then hung out and partied for a couple of days and then got out of there but yeah mm-hmm. yeah I, I, that that particular trip that that was my favorite time though it was it, it was when Basel was still kind of new and the whole like street art shit was like really popping yeah and yeah it was very exciting I guess it's still exciting today but it's just like so blown up that it's kind of like it's like driving past that tree or that architecture right <laughs> it's like oh I've seen this game I've seen this game I've right seen, you know I've seen this building I had stopped like, going for a bunch of years. I was just like, that's just too much ego in one place. And everybody's competing. And it's just, ugh. Yeah. But, but I, I went to a couple of recent ones. I was dating a girl from, from Fort Lauderdale. So I was there. And, yeah. you know, the people had walls that would paint them and see friends and see the beautiful art. And then yeah. duck out and not have to, like, I got to crush this scene or anything, you know? Yeah, that's a weird pressure to have. I And I never really felt that being there. Again, I'm... I'm like, I'm, I don't have any interest really in marketing myself. I, I would love to sell things for millions and millions of dollars just to make it easy to live. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I very rarely put that type of kind of pressure on myself where it's like, I need to be seen. It's a kind of personality, really. Yeah, yeah. And I don't like... really have that. I'm kind mm. of like a wallflower. And I'm not passive or like awkward or insecure. Like, I mostly just don't give much of a fuck. Mm-hmm. Like, I want to do what I do, and if you like it, cool. If you don't, that's cool, too. Well, that's um, a very relaxed kind of vibration to hold. Yeah. And, and that's not to say that I don't have the tensions of, you know... Like, of course, I want my work to be received and respected, mostly amongst my peers. That's, that's really who I'm concerned with, or right. my peers and my contemporaries. Mm-hmm. Um, everybody else, I'm like... It's not really it, like I want everybody to like it, right? Mm-hmm. But I, it does. It's not something that like I lose sleep over. Yeah, it's interesting how the artist both has to make the art, but then find a way to sell it. May it be through promotion or contacts or right place, right time. Yeah, that's usually how I see it, and that's kind of what I meant when I, I mentioned like the mural process being lazy, and it's it's more like things happen mm-hmm. you know i don't try just like today like this just happened to occur right um it turns out we were pretty we were fairly close and mm-hmm. we were able to make it happen so <clears throat> i was I, happy to hit you up and right away you're like yeah i'm around here like you're actually 15 minutes from where i'm staying yeah see so yeah. <laughs> it was like and that's exactly what i mean it's like i i don't believe that our path is set for us. I, I, I believe in free will, but I also believe in just kind of letting things happen as they may. Mm-hmm. And in a sense, not trying too hard. Because mm-hmm. I find when I try hard, I, I tend to get disappointed. Right, you trust in the universe, it will give you what you need. In a way, but I also don't see the universe as a, uh, a gifting universe. Do you know what I mean? Um, in, in the sense that I think the universe is mostly trying to kill us all the time. Really? But, yeah, constantly, nah. constantly. <laughs> um, but I, I don't think of it as a sentient being in the sense of order. And You don't see uh, it as a, like a like personality. Destiny. Yeah, I don't see it, uh, a destiny written. Mm-hmm. I feel like time is constantly writing itself over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. But Versus, you seem to trust it. I... I think I now trust the process. Whether it's the universe dropping these gifts on me or not, I, I can't say. I don't think so, but if that's the case, I, I've followed the plan, right? You're in the and, flow, and, at least. Because if that's true, there's also no mistakes. 
Do you know what I mean? Like, there's no flaws. Like, but sometimes people could fuck up. But if, but if, there's the, learning if, the gifts, that too. if the gifts are from the universe, then the flaws too must also be from the universe, right? Right. So, and I've actually, in saying this, I've been thinking a lot how, like, new things don't arise without problems. Mm -hmm. Like, there's no solution unless there's a problem, right? So the more problems that we face tend to be a way to give us better solutions. And well, it just helps us grow into like better humans or spirits or whatever. Yeah, or worse in some yeah. cases. Well, <laughs> no, no, but it depends I think, how you, 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 what you make out of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's, I think, as artists, like I, I, the creative problem solving mind will take a problem and be like, okay, what the fuck is going on here? What can I do? What happens if A, B, or C happens as I, as I move forward? Okay, you know, it's game theory. So, mm -hmm. like, whether the universe is dropping gifts or not, I don't know. But I do trust that if I stick with the work, keep doing what I'm doing, things will come. And I don't have to, like, sell my ass to, to make them arrive. Mm -hmm. You know, just stay to my work, keep to my morals, keep to my ethics, and hope for the best. Oh, you know? And it's worked it, so far. It seems like you're a good person doing good things, and your perspective is different from mine, but I enjoy your perspective too, you know, because you're just seeing it uh, through different eyes, and that's yeah. refreshing to me. Um, I, I, see, I think it's interesting how you see art as a... Uh, creative problem solving because I would never see art as a as a problem or something to be solved, even though there is a mathematical equation that you yeah, want to yeah, figure yeah. out. And that's know, what I mean. It's like a game, like to a me. puzzle, right? You know, you have all the pieces, right. and that's I think that's the fun of it too. Like, mm -hmm. it's not a problem in the sense of like solving world hunger, uh -huh. but. You know, it's like... This okay. wall's too white. <laughs> it needs to be less white. <laughs> well, so the, the owner of the company was in here today, and we were talking about th this line work in here. Uh -huh. And I was like, God, it's a real pain in the ass. Well, he was not into it? Because I think it's No, boring. no, no, he likes it. But okay. we, we were talking about the actual, like, process of it. Okay. And I was like, you know, the ink has to be the perfect mixture of it's too watery. What are, you, what are you using, by the way, for this black ink? Because it's... Beautiful and opaque and flat. Uh, actually, I just uh, this is a mixture. Of, so to be on the wall, I, I usually use a much uh, f more fluid ink mixture because uh -huh. um, I like to paint flat. Right. So the ink won't run anywhere when I paint flat, right? Yeah. But if it's on the wall, if there's just a smidge too much water in the brush or the ink is too wet, you're going to be chasing drips all over the place. Right. And so to avoid that, I make a, a mixture. Um, so are all these colors also ink? Uh, no, most of it is acrylic, latex, house paint. Okay, nice. House paint um, that you mix. Cool. Yeah. Kind of like what Jason does. And the black, the same? The black is um, a mixture. I just recently started using um, Montana's black acrylic, fluid acrylic. It's super, super nice. Okay, the ones that go in the pens? No, they come in just like, like it looks like the oh, okay. like a Liquitex or Golden Right, container. right, the ones that have the little... With the little yeah. yeah, and um, I mix that with some Golden Black and some Black Gesso. Oh, wow. Um, black, black Gesso? Yeah. Oh, my God. The black are... Gesso thickens it up a little bit uh -huh. and also flattens the little bit of sheen in the ink and makes it more um, opaque. Interesting. I've never heard that. Yeah. Did you ever try the, the black... Uh, well, I guess you did since you were playing with in mass. Do you remember what we were using back then? I don't know what the mix was. It was like liquid pigment and, uh, and varnish, like either... Or medium, I mean, you know? Like, yeah. Uh, and that, like, the, the, the black pigment was just like pure black, but needed that that medium to kind of like yeah. make it a little bit more plastic and it was very flowy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was and, really good. And opaque. And I've, I've, I've gone through a ton of different mixtures. Mm -hmm. But, but really I really nice. like this one. Yeah, this is great. I use the, the Montana black paint mm -hmm. uh, directly on my paintings without, okay. without any of the mixes. Mm -hmm. um, just because I end up varnishing the paintings anyway. But Interesting. Yeah, yeah have, this I, one's I, really nice. I've never seen it. So like the Montana from Germany or the Montana from Barcelona? Um, I, th 
Is it like the MTN or the four word Montana? I'd have to look. I'm yeah, not yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll check out later. They're really good. They come with the like the little metal ball in the in the container. Uh-huh. Um, it works really good. Sick. And I, I use that pretty regularly now. And it, it, my friend runs um, visual art gallery. And it's like a little, there's a gallery on the side and then a little art store. And over the last year and a half, I've really been like focusing on putting my money into his business. Mm-hmm. Besides like the big like big store art store brands um and he he helps out the communities like get stuff like always gives me a better deal on the spray paint than anywhere else and beautiful so i've I've been trying to put my money back into his business as much as i can it's good to support friends yeah so mike um are you did you go to art school or are you self-taught um i did not go to art school um i was already making art in high school, um, just kind of trying to figure out how to paint. Tons of drawing. It's it's funny. I, as I sat in here this past week, I was thinking about how like just sitting at my friend's house, hanging out, smoking weed, or playing video games, or drinking, or whatever. I would just any piece of paper I would just draw on, like fill it up, toss it, like grab another piece of paper. I, I have a, a buddy's dad who would make a joke that like you couldn't leave pens around me because I would mm-hmm. you know start drawing and then take off with them. How um, dare you use that pen for drawing? Yeah, <laughs> and just thinking about how like that was my norm, it's still my norm, but doing it in this environment now, like this large scale mm-hmm. in this building, just like doodling on the walls. Like to me, nice. it's the same thing. Um, but I had I had considered it, um, like right out of you know, 18, 19, thinking about going to art school. But then um, I got a job working for Shepard Ferry. Mm-hmm. Um, were you his, um, was he like, uh, were you like apprenticing under him or you were his assistant? Was it no, paid? I, I or was, it, was a, it was a job. I, um, I was essentially his assistant, but, you know, like most of the stuff I was doing was like, you know, shipping out posters and stickers and doing uh, like all that stuff. But it so happened that his office for his design firm housed all the the Obey stuff too. So, mm-hmm. and that was before he was doing shirts and everything. So it was just prints and what stickers. Year, what year was this? It was 99 to 2001. Beautiful. I was there. And it was in San Diego. Yeah, we mm-hmm. were downtown, and I lived with them too. Oh, cool! So the print shop, uh, where all the posters, the screen printing posters, were done, was in the garage at the house. So I ended up being around, you know, a world of graphic design, illustration. Um, Dave Kinsey was his partner, so I was mm. working around him too, and wow. you know, a handful of production artists who were all super talented and skilled. Mm-hmm. Um, so I essentially got an education in a two-year chunk while getting paid, you know, 40 hours a week. Sick. And, you know, was able to immerse myself in this art culture that I had been searching for without knowing that it existed. Um, kind of via doing things on the street. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we connected and I ended up, you know, being able to, like watch how these guys were painting watch how these like i would i would be in the office all the time and like i would you know all the computers were on a network so i would take and copy files and start to break them down again back to the creative problem solving right so i would take somebody's design that they did and i wasn't you know i'd started to use photoshop and illustrator already um but wasn't very good at it and started to like break like uh you know break down how they were making these images and you know in a way i'm self-taught because i'm curious in that way like oh how the fuck did they do that and that's how i learned to paint you know my favorite painters like how the fuck did they do that and Mm. then having these artists that were around me because it was like constant um and constant art on the walls around me you know so i i had a whole great influence i see that's another advantage of living down here right like that could never happen to me up there in montreal and again these are all things it was like you know just the luck of the draw you know it's like or it was the universe dropping me how did it happen um 
Well, me and uh, my buddy who writes Onions now, um, who's still like my favorite graffiti writer of all time, like uh, he kind of like opened up this little world to me um, of doing stuff on the streets. And I had, you know, I, I was already familiar with graffiti and like doing shit outside in high school, but kind of figured out a route to start doing it with what I was already doing. Um, Cause I always sucked at at lettering, like it was just horrible all the time. And I mean, I could do it, but it's like I I knew it didn't feel right. It's like it wasn't right. Um, and so like I would go with him like down to the graffiti pits and paint with my paintbrushes, you know, just because that's what I was comfortable with. Um, but so he and I like we had a couple years, like we had one particular summer where we were just like all right, we're going to fucking smash San Diego. Mm-hmm. And that's what we did. We went out like like it was a religion and got up. And so because it's such a small knit community for that realm of creatives in, in this town, in this city, um, you kind of get noticed fast if you, if you go wreck shop. What was your name? Oh, God, I had a bunch. I, I think at that, at that point it was Agent Orange. Okay. Um, but then it just got taken down to AO because um, I felt weird using it. Uh, I've never been comfortable with using a, a pseudonym, a, a fake name. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and I always find it weird. But uh, so we were doing stuff outside and got noticed. And um, we had did. There was the Andy Kaufman movie that Jim Carrey starred in. Man on the Moon? <clears throat> yeah. Um, Black Market, which was Shepard's design firm, did all the poster marketing for those. Mm. He did a design, and those were getting put up everywhere. So back in the 90s, we would get these gigs where it's like you could pay a dollar a poster to go, we paste posters up. And, you know, just fill up a construction site full of these things and get, you know, a couple hundred bucks. Um, so we had done one of those and a couple other things, um, and turns out his assistant was leaving the job to, you know, do whatever he was going to do. Um, an artist who's still in San Diego, actually, um, or was, uh, and so the job opened up, and he was like, "Hey, you want to do this?" I was like, "Sure, why not?" And to me, I was just like, "I'm just going to go work." You know, I didn't think much about it. Like I thought it was cool. I was like, "Oh, this will be fun. Be in this environment." But I ended up getting a really important education and like on a fast track too, like mm-hmm. you know, the, like on steroids essentially. Sick, that's so lucky. And you know, watching Shepard, he was such a workaholic. I'm, I'm sure he still is. I don't know, but like Can imagine <laughs> like putting in like real work, like working in the in the studio for ten hours, then going out at night and going bombing and shit. Um, so I kind of I kind of got a a first-hand perspective on how to make shit happen and right. how you could work with these companies, how you could work with, like, I was, I, I think I was 20. Yeah, I must, I, it was before I was 21. Um, no, that's not true. I was probably 21. Um, got a gig doing an album cover for the Nappy Roots, mm-hmm. um, this Southern hip hop band, and was like walking into the head of A&R at Atlantic Records as a dumb fuck 21 year old and, and and it's all because i was able to see it's like oh you just connect you gotta go and do it yeah and make things happen they like your work you're gonna get paid and yeah. so um i i just needed to see that there was a way mm-hmm. you know i was already on the path but i just was at like a crossroads of like how do you how do you apply this to real life mm-hmm. you know i thought i was going to be a cartoonist like that's honestly what like Sunday newspaper cartoonist, mm. like that was, and part for me it was like because that's where you know obviously that's a job somebody gets paid to do that, um, and it's always as a young person that was always like okay how do you get paid to do this, which sucks but it's like that's you have to make some money to pay your bills and continue to be able to, you know, continue the process. So luckily I didn't have to go to art school and I was already. I started doing shows right away, getting these like side gigs that pad the bank account, and um, you know just went for it. 
So beautiful. Yeah, saved me, saved myself some debt. Mm. You know, but I, I at this, even though I got that education, I still kind of wish that I had taken the time to do it. Okay. Um, even though it would have left you with a bunch of debt. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> it depends, <laughs> but. I would prefer not to have the debt, obviously. Well, but that's I the think American the, situation. The, mostly the experience of being in those types of environments with the, with the similar types of people. Because, I mean, although I, I, I got this job and it gave me an education, I was still winging it on my own for the most part. You know, I think having those environments to learn in and push yourself and challenge yourself is really good. Um, I think sometimes art school teachers push themselves onto their students a little too much uh, in terms of style. But that's uh, the chance for the student to have something to rebel against, too. Yeah, true. And I mean, I'm sure that's what, that's what happens. But mm -hmm. um, I, I think having, I, I regret not having that experience a little bit. The, mm -hmm. Another thing that doesn't keep me up at night, but you know, it would have been interesting. I think that learning curve, I think, I think people get really skilled you know, I, I had to take my, my career has been a lot of like, okay, I figured something out. Okay, I fucked something up. Okay, I figured out how to fix that fuck up. Now I'm here. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, when I meet young artists or I'm talking to other artists who maybe are like on the beginning of their journey, like that I will give them tips. And sometimes it comes off as pretentious, I've noticed. And it's not, it's not designed to be. It's not like, I know something that you don't. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like with art, it's almost like it's like a parasite. It wants to help other people. Yeah, like yeah. I want to help. It wants to get into other hosts. Mm -hmm. So like, like I'm sure there's people that if you're like, what's your black ink mixture? They'll be like, I can't tell you. It's a secret. <laughs> you know? But to me, I'm like, hey, if this helps somebody else, then. Why not? Why not? How do, how do you lose anything by right. doing that? Right. Exactly. So. It's um, good karma at the end. Yeah, I, that's, I, I want to be able to make it to where other people don't have to go through so many steps. But that could be problematic as well, too, because sometimes maybe you have to go through all those steps to really get to where you are. Mm -hmm. But sometimes having a little bit of a cheat code, you know, skip a couple stages, maybe you'll progress that much quicker or whatever but right well um, we we're a little bit older generation compared to others and right. uh, we had to make a lot of mistakes in order to find what works for us yeah. um you ever thought of maybe teaching a workshop um i i've considered it yeah like i've i've gone and given like some like uh guest lectures at like the university of san diego um to the art department um but yeah, again, that's not one of those things I would go. Look, I would go be like, okay, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm mm -hmm. gonna. Sometimes you just gotta kind of like do it, so people are like, oh, he does workshops, and then more of those get offered. But till you yeah. do it, people are like, well, I've never seen him do one, so I'm not gonna hit him up. Yeah, like yeah people yeah. hit me up, be like, hey, you wanna do a workshop here because they've seen me do it elsewhere. Right. So I don't yeah, know. I would be open. Like I said, it's like a parasite trying to leave the host to a new one. Like mm -hmm. I love sharing. The process of it you know totally like it, it, this mural project is indoors but i've done tons outside where little kids are usually the ones that come up and are all excited mm -hmm. i'll be like all right don't tell your mom yeah Give them the spray can let them spray something yeah. or paint something you know it's like spread the virus of art <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i love that shit and you know i would love to teach i think that would be great i think that's another problem with art school too though is that a lot of people like go to get accreditation so that they could just end up teaching again. Oh. But, you know, to each their own. For, you know. Right. Let's talk about your art. Uh, okay. I, I remember last time that we were hanging out, you do a lot of this stuff with the lines, and it used to be a lot about like old school people with their beards and stuff. Yeah. This seems to be a different flavor. I really like it. It seems like very colorful and and nice what yeah. would you say if, i don't know if there's a unifying uh, subject matter in your artwork but what, what's the topics that you like to touch into um well it's kind of funny like even my last show like it was work that i did over an entire year um so I, or maybe even two years of of collecting work and i'm constantly changing like i'm constantly doing different things i get bored really easily um if things seem repetitive um i i just 
revolt, you know, immediately. Um, and I, and like, I, you know, the topic of creative problem solving continues to come up. Mm -hmm. But it's like, if I've figured out the problem, if I figured out how to get to the answer already, I want a new question, mm. you know? Right. Um, so a lot of my work, it varies depending on the month, you know? Mm -hmm. Like for this, um, they really liked a lot of the stuff that I do on the trains. So like I do like, um, uh, like streakers on the trains where I just draw little monikers as fast as I can. Like you bomb the trains, like you jump the... Yeah, the just train. go to the, like the, the auto, like the, the benching spots here where the trains are parked and mm -hmm. we'll just go draw on them with, with, um, with the streaker markers, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the, like wax pens. Oh, cool. And so the last like two years I've focused a lot on doing um, that work. Mm -hmm. um, which to do that, I, I started drawing a bunch of images repetitively, um, and a lot of which are up on this wall now. Mm -hmm. um, and I would draw them all the time as a way, like it would, I would like fill up sheets of paper with them over and over and over again as like a test to be like, I know exactly how to draw this. I do it fast. I don't have to think too much, and I can get the fuck out of there when I need to. Because even though it's not like that big a deal, like in terms of illegality or getting in trouble, it's like mostly you don't want to get caught trespassing, essentially. Um, so you try to be fast and kind of quiet and get in and get out. Mm -hmm. um, That's fun. I've never done that. Uh, I, I got a couple of good friends, Labrona and other, who yeah, do it. Yeah. But I've never actually uh, it, it's gone great with them. because it's like it's it's a whole different sub community. Um, you start seeing the same people all the time, uh, and people see your stuff in different places. It, to have art travel is one of the like greatest thrills, mm -hmm. you know. It, so it's like this thing is moving, and there's this small little subculture of maybe, you know, maybe there's a thousand people in the country doing it on the regular, you mm -hmm. know, and then you can tell who's who's busy. And I come from a family that worked on the train lines. Like I have, I have a picture of my great. It's either great or great. great I think it's my great grandfather. Mm -hmm. um, it's from 1915. And there's a picture of him. And it, it, there's a mythos around him that, like, one day he got on the train and just never came back. Mm -hmm. um, which who knows how that worked out. But um, I have a of this photo of him that I love. And it's, it's tiny, it's old, it's all like kind of like crinkly and fucked up. And um, it's him standing against the train looking all like kind of gangster. And I noticed that there's a little moniker drawn on the train back then. Wow. You know, so like I, there's a different, there's a weird feeling about it. Because, you know, it's, it's not for sale. It's for the love of it. Mm -hmm. And it's a communication tool that's, you know, it's like a hundred years old. It's like a love letter. Yeah, to to, to only the other people who, because nobody sees this shit unless you go in a train yard. You're not going to see it. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes trains are parked close to streets, and like maybe you get a glimpse. But unless you're taking the effort to go out there and see it, you, it it's not being done. You know, yeah. of course you can see it on the internet, right? But right. Um, but the people who are out there taking the photos of those things that get on the internet are the ones who are out there doing it. Right. I got to make the effort to go out there at some point and, you know, not go down and deep as you, but I'd like to do a little bit just you to should. play. It, I, I've brought people out, like people who weren't doing it before. Other artists come out and start to, to fuck around. Mm -hmm. it, it's, there's a joy to it. It has um, a sense of that, like sense of adventure that you would get when you were a kid. Mm -hmm. You like fill your backpack up with shit and be like, All right, I'm just going to go climb that mountain or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like just go explore a fucking tunnel or a drainage ditch or whatever. It has that, that sense of um, excitement and, and thrill. You know you're, you're doing something kind of illegal. Like I've had, I've been on the train line before and had um, one of the workers drive up. It's crazy. They have these like pickup trucks that have train wheels on them mm -hmm. so they could drive from spot to spot. Okay. And he just came around this corner and it was like too late for me to see him. Mm. And I, I was like, all right, let's see what's happening. And I was like, hey man, that's crazy. I've never seen a truck like that before. Like that's weird. And uh, like tried to throw him off a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And he was like, 
Just get off the property. Uh, okay. Nice. I'll see you. That's, that's um, funny. Uh, and I've been looking, like, I've had to duck and hide under the trains because cops drive by or whatever. Have you ever jumped a train? No. I no. love to do that. I, that's on my bucket list, too. But yeah. The older I get, the less possible it's. Well, I'll tell you to... what, because I follow all the, like, train um, moniker things, like, I, I watch all the Instagrams. There's one guy who works on the train line that I see, and he posts the crashes all the time. Like trains that derail or get fucked up, whoa, and just makes makes me nervous as fuck. Does, does, that, you, does that happen a lot? It, it happens enough to see it on his Instagram page pretty regularly. Wow. Yeah, it would scare the fuck out of me. Right, because there's no seatbelts on that situation. No, and if another car comes and smashes into the one that you're sitting in, whoa, you could be fucked pretty easily. Yeah, man. And you know, I'm sure that's I'm sure it's rare Ish. in actuality, but. Um, it, it's definitely a possibility, and it, that shit is dangerous. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of like, you know, at 42, I'm kind of like, I want to be comfortable. You know, I don't want to clack on a train for six hours, shit in a bucket or whatever the fuck you got to do. <laughs> right. Like, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, you got to sit for that long. The right? idealism, like the the romanticism of it, is there for me, but yeah. the reality of it is like, I can't. I yeah, I think that train has sailed for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I might be past my prime, but yeah. I mean, you never know. You Maybe never in know. In the 90s, it would have been cool. Yeah. Uh, I, I just don't want to get in trouble, you know, like, you know, in my 40s. Like, I got more to lose if you yeah. know, the shit goes bad. Yeah. Um, but, so, but back to the art thing, mm -hmm. like, you, I do have, like, a whole range of different things that I, I like to choose from. And, like, I'll do, and again, like I said, I, was, I thought I was going to be a cartoonist when I grew up. So a lot of that is still in the work that I do, like a sort of exaggerated f version of real life. Um, I do a lot of like photo referenced work, so I'll make things be a little bit more realistic in, in some, some days. And then some days I'll do, like my last show had probably like six abstract pieces. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes I just want to fucking move paint around. Sometimes I want to be sloppy and then after I get the sloppy out of the way for a little bit, I'll be like, I want to be like super fucking tight, mm. clean lines, everything like crisp and perfect. So mm -hmm. I, I have a little bit of like an ADD mentality when it comes to creating. And, and it's, it's not like conscious choice. I'm not like, well, you know what's really selling now is mm -hmm. abstract expressionism, neo abstract expression, whatever. Um, it's like internally, that's what my body feels. Like I feel like I work from feeling a lot yeah. like if if something's a mess sometimes i just need to push paint around mm -hmm. and sometimes i just need to like have color and they'll i'll i'll feel a sense of comfort and balance and like okayness with with doing that um and then some days i'll have to be like fucking tight as shit and like everything <laughs> very specific and in line and what i what i want it to be hmm. um, kind of like polar huh a little bit, yeah, and and not in, not in my per, my personality is pretty much the same all the time. But I, I, you got moods for what you need to express. Yeah, 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 and, and how you need to express it. I've never felt a need to like, you know, like a band makes an album and it's like a big pop hit or whatever, and like they're automatically like their fans are going to say the next one. Oh, this doesn't sound the same. And then you whatever. make another row. Yeah, <laughs> I, I kind of follow that same method. It's like I, I make what I feel, um, and unless of course it's like a project like this, like there's an art director and it's like, well, we like this, but we don't like that. We like you this, gotta satisfy like the that. client. You know, yeah. So the, there'll be moments of that, but in my my personal art making practice, it. It's from day to day, it could be something different. And mm -hmm. <clears throat> I feel like it's a double-edged sword doing that. Um, I feel like commercial success sometimes depends on regularity. Um, just because it helps, I think it helps sell things. Um, and unfortunately <laughs> for my own career, I... I can't fall into that mode at all. I can't stick to the same thing. Um, I, even in like, it's like the playlist that I listened to today and yesterday, like yesterday I listened to a 90s playlist because it reminded me of being a teenager on Spotify. And then today I was playing an 80s list because it reminded mm -hmm. me of being a kid. 
And it's like, it depends on the day. Like yeah. I could, I could change from here to there. But the funny thing is, is that no matter how different the work looks, it's still the same for me. Like the feeling is still the same. And it, it always feels like me. It never feels like I'm trying to be one thing or another. It always like, has your vibe. Yeah, it always has my touch. Yeah. Um, and I know that, but maybe a general public like like my last show, somebody could walk into that show and be like, "This is three different artists who mm -hmm. who did this show," right? But it was all me. I um, think that's more interesting. I think like I do too. When there's an artist that finds one thing that works, that's cool and shit. You know, like it's great that that thing worked. But if every painting's the same tricks, like okay, cool, I saw that like already five times. Give yeah. me another trick. You know, yeah. it's like a skate park where they're just doing kickflips. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, okay, totally. Cool. And okay. that's I feel like for me to stay sane. Um, it's important to make those changes. But it, again, like I say that and it sounds like it's a conscious effort, but it really, it really isn't. Like sometimes I just go in the studio and I don't have, like, I like not knowing what the fuck I'm gonna do or what I'm gonna make. And then there's some days I'm like, all right, I know what I need to make today. Mm -hmm. And both of those things show up randomly throughout my life. Mm -hmm. um, and I think once you look, when you step back, and look at, at everything in context, it makes sense. But from piece to piece, sometimes it could be a little, um, you know, a bit of a medley. Yeah, well, I think that's interesting. So would you say there's like a psychedelic element to your art? Yeah, I, I mean, in some senses, I, I feel like more so psychedelics have changed me in the way that I think. Um, and that comes out in the work. Mm -hmm. I think it's a little more, like, it, it, I think it's subtle. Mm -hmm. um, but there's definitely, and I, I don't necessarily, I don't put it into the work as like a conversation about those mechanisms. But I feel like, er, like my early psychedelic use uh, adapted my mind to, to think differently. Mm -hmm. And not in like a better or worse or whatever, like, oh, I'm more highly elevated or whatever the fuck, but more in like just thinking from a different perspective, thinking, it opened thinking up about things differently. Mm -hmm. Like that feeling that you get when you're on psychedelics that you know everything. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. you figured it out. You figured out the universe. You figured out the world. Right. And it's it's only fleeting in those moments, but it's there. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's a repetitive thing. It feels real when yeah. you're in it. Yeah. Like I, I, I had a, a really strong LSD experience where me and my buddy both took it and went back to his mom's house. We were teenagers mm -hmm. and at their house, they fucking loved the movie Back to the Future, all of them. Like, it, I, they must have watched it thousands <laughs> of times, right? Like, it would just, and these were the VCR days. How could not one much, man not? <laughs> not much cable, right. you know, so it would play all the time. And I, I was like, at some point, we, 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 sat, <laughs> we were sitting on the couch with his mom. She had no, she was a very sweet woman, had no idea we were high as fuck on LSD. <laughs> um, I started to explain to her the meaning of Back to the Future. And I don't remember what I said now. I'm not going to have some grandiose expression about it. But no. that's the, I know, I know. But <laughs> that's, and that's that, that like dream feeling because it goes away, right? Like uh -huh. you're in it then. But like when you try to remember it later, it's not quite all there. What did a mom say? I, I, I don't know. But well, she's like, this kid's a genius. No, she probably was like, these <laughs> fucking idiots. You know what I mean? I, I, another one, I wrote a, a, a deep essay on um, Goodfellas uh -huh. while I was, like, one of the most, like, psychedelic <laughs> experiences I've ever had. I took it before summer school uh -huh. and it just lost it. But um, that feeling of, like, you know something, you understand it. Even if you don't and it's just a part of the, the mental capacities that take place, I think something about that mindset stuck with me into my sober, uh, if you will, experience. Um, and so I think in that way, psychedelia shows into my work 
in in some form. Like a subtle way. Yeah. Subconscious. Yeah. I feel like you almost have to know me to know it's there. There'll be little things like like even putting the third eye on on a lot of stuff, which I like to do. Part of because I think it looks creepy sometimes too, and it's a, a form of distortion. But it's also like a representation of that like thinking mind and and how different substances can make it feel and think in dramatically different ways, right? Mm -hmm. And the, our perceptions of reality, you know. Uh, I, th I think that early usage really got me to question um, a everything, you know, in mm -hmm. a big way. And a lot of my work does come out of the form of like questioning whether it be authority, um, a status quo, a societal norm, um, or even just general opinion, you know? Like, mm -hmm. I would love, like, playing devil's advocate, for instance. Like, just if somebody has a strong opinion about something, then they should be willing to stand up to an opposing strong opinion. Right. And listen, and, and you know, hear what somebody else has to say. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that's mostly the way that psychedelics have affected my work. Do you still smoke a lot of weed? I do, yeah. Pretty regularly. Yeah, I remember yeah. on your documentary with Mike Giant, uh -huh. it was like a big theme, the weed smoking. Yeah, I mean... How's your uh, relationship with him? Are you guys a good friend still? Yeah, we, yeah, he moved to San Diego uh, like a little over a year ago. Nice, he um, was in Boulder before, right? He was in Boulder and then New Mexico. Um, he was getting um, alt uh, altitude sickness oh, wow. really bad. Oh, damn. Um, and as soon as he got here, he bad sea level you see he got better mm -hmm. um but yeah we we actually we go hit the train sometimes okay it's i gotta so it's been a while since i've seen him i gotta i gotta go go pop in mm -hmm. does um, he still do that brand what's the name of his brand no rebel eight rebel eight yeah yeah no the guy the original guy who started it still does it but oh, okay. I, I don't think he does uh, it's not his brand anymore yeah i think he I always he thought he sold it was his it was he was a part of it yeah, I just thought it was like, you know, the Mike Giant brand. Yeah, it was his buddy, um, Josh, started it um, and is still doing it, I think. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't tattoo anymore, right? Um, occasionally. He tattooed me a couple times while he's been in town. Um, but it, he was working at what uh, it's called Big Trouble Tattoo. Um, my friend um, Adam Hawthorne uh, runs that place. He's tattooed me a couple times, too. And was on my old podcast a long time ago. Um, he was working out of there. But yeah, I mean, we, cannabis, if we will, um, is something that uh, is a pretty regular staple in my process. Mm -hmm. Like, I think um, my ability to focus and sit down and work, my ability to, again, back to the creative problem solving, to think about things differently, to look at it from a different angle, different perspective. Um, cannabis in my brain seems to be helped along in the process through that way. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's good for just like the sitting and looking, you know? Like sometimes I, I told one of the guys that works here, I was like, you'll probably see me just staring at the wall. Like, don't worry, I'm not like catatonic or, you know. You're not like, slacking off. No, it, it's part of the work, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that ability to just sit and stare at something for a while, um, cannabis seems to enhance those things. Mm -hmm. um, helps with me when I get bored, you know, a big boredom killer for me. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's, it's still with me. Nice, <laughs> beautiful. Yeah. So you used to do this podcast, uh, Live Free, was it called, right? Yeah, the Live Free podcast. Uh, how? When did you do it? How long did it lasted? And uh, I did it for five years. Okay. So it was um, maybe like 2009, 2014, 2010, 2015, somewhere along that route. I'm okay. terrible with dates. <laughs> this is in, well, know, I, at, I, right I, after the I weed conversation. In, I remember you interviewed me after we met 2011. So you were yeah. already doing it by then. Yeah. So it's probably like 2009, 2014. Yeah. Um, did like 170 some odd episodes. Some really great stuff too. Like yeah, I'm, I remember I'm really proud of it. it. Yeah. I think your podcast was one of the first podcasts I ever 
heard. There wasn't like a lot of podcasts back no, then, uh -uh. then, there, then. Especially yeah. in the art genre. Um, right. I was hanging out with a bunch of comedians at the time, and they had already started doing podcasting to promote their shows and to sit and talk shit and you know help like elevate the people around them who they thought were funny. And I was like. Man, artists are such interesting people, and they always people are always thinking like we're reclusive, like weirdo, awkward types. Which, of course, were those things too. But mm -hmm. um, <laughs> a lot of that like reclusiveness is because you got to be working. You got to be by yourself in the fucking studio, like doing the work, or it doesn't get done. Right. Um, and I knew from having conversations with people that they're really interesting pasts. You know, like what they go through in their day to day is really interesting, and how they got from A to B. Um, so I was like, yeah, I'm gonna start talking to these people and get recordings and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And I ended up picking up, it, it, you know, got a lot of downloads, a lot of people listened to it. And like, I, I had somebody, um, I forget who the artist was that was on the show, but one of their friends um, hit me up and they're like, I've known person, this person for 15 years and I didn't know a lot of this stuff that I heard on the podcast about them. You right. Know? So it turned out, it's actually funny, like you had mentioned that documentary with, that me and Mike did. Right. A part of... What was it called? Uh, it was called Working Class. Working Class. And what, what's the platform you could find it? Um, I, you know, I don't know. Um, it, it was on, maybe it's on Vimeo. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, it was sold as a DVD. Mm -hmm. um, it might be on the director's site. I'm not sure. You guys sure. got to bring that stuff back. I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but part of doing that, I was like, the guy who made the film was a really good filmmaker, but mm -hmm. I thought his interview skills were really shitty. Mm. Like, he asked very, like, like, questions that, like, would elicit short answers. Surface. Yeah, and it's like he's just trying to get people to talk and he's a, he's a filmmaker. He's, a, he's like a camera guy. Like, you can get the shot really nice. He makes it look nice. beautiful, right. right. Um, and I was like, you know, I could do this. Like, because by the time we were like into that process, like I was kind of like self-interviewing and then like when it would be me and Mike together, like I would be trying to like flow the conversation. And I was like, I, you know, I could probably do this. Like, maybe I should start talking and recording with people. Um, and so I just did it. And mm. then didn't stop until I got burnt out. And then just let it go. At um, one point you just got over it? Yeah, it's like it's I was ironic doing like, because now the, the podcasts are so I know, big. I know. It's almost like it's, you should have like kept on writing that way right? till it fucking yeah, broke. Yeah, it's too early. <laughs> um, well, it's never too late. No, no, I, I, I've had the thoughts of starting something new again. Um, but you already got the skills. No, right? Yeah, it's it's almost like I just didn't want to do all the the added work. Mm. Like I, I would sit down and do the talking. It's fine. Um, it's all the background. This work. is the fun part. This is this is the great part, yeah. and it's, it it would it was super rewarding for me. Um, I feel like it helped my career even in that like I was opening myself up to all these different people and the people who they or like that like them um mm. and I, I learned a lot about myself by being willing to be open and expressive about things that i didn't talk to other people about um and got to know you know a bunch of even people who i knew already like really you get to know people and like we don't really sit down and have these long conversations very often anymore Right. Um, so because you kind of feel like you already know them, you're not gonna be like, so tell me how you started your career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, I just, you know, I, I thought it was really valuable and it was fun. It was fun to do. Um, mm. But after doing so much, it's like I needed a change. It's kind of like doing a new painting. Yeah. You did that painting so much. And you <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's yeah. I started to feel myself get a little repetitive because yeah. um, I had figured out a, a method, I had figured out an equation, uh -huh. and st was following that pretty regularly. Um, and just doing the background work was too much. And I felt myself um, moving away from my art practice a little bit. Mm -hmm. Because at the same time, I was really, really entrenched in jujitsu too. Mm -hmm. I just started learning it and was like practicing like nonstop. So I had these things that I felt were taking away from my art making process. Um, and whether they really were in actuality or not, I can't say. But that's just the feeling that I had. And I've worked from those feelings, so I was like, you know, I'm gonna just set this aside for mm -hmm. a while. 
Well, and I felt okay not doing it anymore. Like it, it was. Mm -hmm. it, if I was supposed to go back and do it, I would. I would. Um, well, it's good to take. But a break. it's like I. I need a new website right now. Like I, I need to build one. But because I, put, I put all my podcast stuff onto my old website, and it's so like the way it's built. It's like a tweaker took apart three cars and put it back together to make one new car, kind of. Mm. Um, that I'm continuing to pay for an old site only because those things are hosted there and I just want them to stay in the, the internet ether and be able to still be downloaded in all the places that they're available. Mm -hmm. Just because I feel like it's important. But um, yeah, I could, well, I could see myself doing something again, but you know. I hope you bring Live Free back. Uh, I actually heard uh, my giant interviewing you on his new podcast. Oh, yeah. So now yeah. he's got a podcast too. Yeah. So I heard uh, you on him and Jeremy Fish and yeah. some of his friends. And that's what's fun when the podcast is an artist itself because we know each other. Yeah. Like this, this whole podcast that I'm doing, so far I'd say like 90% of the people I'm interviewing are like my friends yeah. who I know and there's like a vibe and I yeah. know their message. So that's just fun for me. Like it's, and that's we know how to con – we know we're – we're, it's like we're speaking the same language. That's why, I like, the guy who directed that film, he's a director, he's a, he's a filmmaker, he's a photographer. Like, he speaks a, a slightly different language, you know? Right. So and maybe that, that they didn't make it flow as good to express you guys' yeah, yeah, vibe yeah. as well. And that's having, being in your, in your position now, you, you know, you have a wealth of experience. You know what this game is about. You well, know, I'm, I'm still learning how to do interviews, for example. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. that will all come, but the, the, the content... You're well aware of, you know, the trials and tribulations of art making, what, what it mm -hmm. takes to survive. I know yeah. what I like and I know who's interesting. Yeah. So, you know, I go hunt you guys out and, uh, yeah. you know, I share them to my audience. So yeah. that, that's super yeah. fun for me. Yeah. Um, talking about uh, podcast, uh, I'd say like the most popular podcast these days would be the Joe Rogan one. And you did the logo for it. Yeah. That was, that came out, uh, shit, I guess... Ten years, nine years ago now. Yeah, I I just posted. It was within the last month. Um, like one of my little Facebook memories popped up when it first showed up mm -hmm. in like the iTunes store, like the logo. Mm -hmm. um, How yeah. did that come about? Again, super fucking like just like random occurrence. Um, I I was already listening. Well. My sister was working at the comedy store here in San Diego, mm -hmm. which is like the big comedy club in LA and here, or one of the ones in LA and the like big one here. And I, I had already been following Joe a little bit. Like I used to watch um, news radio, which he was on when I was a kid, which is funny, and Fear Factor and all that shit. Mm -hmm. um, but he was doing a comedy show here uh, downtown at this little arena. And I hit my sister up because I knew that she was friends with the guy who was opening up uh, for Joe. And I was like, hey, do you think you can get tickets? They were sold out already. I was like, any chance you can get a ticket or two for this show? And she's like, yeah, let me call Ari um, and, and see if I can get you on the guest list. Because they were friends. They've known, my sister was a waitress at the comedy store for years. And our friends um, that we grew up with run it, uh, like manage it. And... She's like, hey, got you two tickets. They'll be waiting for you at the box office. Cool. Go to the show, whatever. Um, maybe two weeks later, my sister hits me up. She's like, hey, uh, do you think you could do like a little poster for our little front window thing for the show that Ari's doing with two of his buddies? I was like, yeah, of course. You got me those tickets. Scratch my back. I'll scratch yours. No problem. And just made like a little like like 11 by 17 poster that they just put in the little marquee. Nothing big. It didn't take me a lot of time. And um, Joe ended up seeing that uh, through Ari and hit me up to do a poster for um, his Atlanta 420 show that he was doing. Mm -hmm. And one for uh, the Chicago show. It was the same three comedians. Um, and so I was like, yeah, of course. Did the, did the posters, actually got flown out to go to the shows in Chicago and Atlanta. So got to hang out with him and all the guys. So um, sick. And then when I got back, he was probably 
nine episodes, ten episodes into the podcast. Wow. <clears throat> which is like thousands now, you know. I think oh, it's yeah. like 1,300 or something. Something like that, yeah. Um, and he, he hit me up. He's like, hey, I want to do a logo for the podcast. Mm -hmm. And so we ended up taking the image that was on the Atlanta poster, um, adding a microphone to it, and doing a couple little like tweaks, and made it the the podcast logo so it was like up like episode 10 episode 11 something like that and i already knew he had a following because i was already because i was in the martial arts i was already following I was watching the ufc all the time and kind of knew him through there um but i had no idea it would blow up to what it is now it's huge you and, and i'd say like and of course you've done way better things than that logo but sure, yeah. everybody's seen that logo. Like, yeah. it's on every single episode and clip. And I remember even seeing the, like, seeing the interview with, like, Edward Snowden and stuff. You yeah, he talked shit. And, he and shit about it. Like, Your logo scared me. Yeah. And I was like, oh, my friend Mike did it. That's <laughs> wild, right? Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like, it must be feel kind of special that it's out your art's out there so widely. Yeah, I mean, it's an easy thing to be like, if people are like, whoa, what do you do? Be like, have you ever seen this? Okay, you know that's one mm -hmm. thing that I do. Um, but again, I take it with uh, I take it all with a grain of salt too. To me, like it's awesome that that millions of people have put their eyes on it, and they of course a good percentage of them don't know who the fuck I am. But if you Google it, you can find out it's me, you know. Um, and to be able to connect with a group of people who are doing something cool, and you know. Um, be a part of like the cultural fabric is you know I I'm humbled by it in some way um, I, th I I think I have low serotonin uh, so like I tend to not care that that much like sometimes I'm not as excited about it sometimes as like say like my mom would be or something you know what i mean and you know maybe that's it, just the it's like going down that street in georgia for the 20th <laughs> yeah. time yeah it's it, but i mean at the same time I, I i think it's refreshing not to be all like oh yeah i'm that guy who did that thing and you know it'd be kind of sad if that was like your claim to fame like if that yeah, was I a never, thing that made you special you know like, i think maybe maybe i have some insecurity about that because i don't want that to be it no you know what i mean you know it's like people people bring it up and like a part of me is has a, a pride about it it's like yeah i got to do something cool and then a part of me is a little cringe about it like a little like uh, yeah. like because it's your biggest thing but it's not your best thing yeah yeah, yeah. Right. like i've made a million paintings yeah. that are a thousand times better than that right. graphic per the, se. the interview where i had before you is my friend jake brown he's a pro skater and uh He's like won gold medals on the X game. He's done tricks that no one landed before he landed, like yeah. at 720 with no hands, which yeah. is like, what the fuck? But his claim to fame, or what people know him the best for, is he had this bail where he flew up in the air and just dropped four stories and boom. Yeah. Like you've probably even seen yeah, it. Yeah, I think so. And his shoes exploded. Yeah. Out. And, you know, he's so bummed out that people mostly know him for this big fall and not for his, like, accomplishments on the <laughs> yeah, skateboard. Yeah. Even that fall came after he, he landed this one trick for the first time and everybody's like, what the fuck? He landed his thing. And then he fell and everybody's like, the fall, the fall. Yeah. So at least your logo is not, like, a bear, sure. you know? <laughs> it's just, I, I question the popularity of things sometimes. And the, I, I think sometimes, uh, again, like, being a pessimist... Uh, like sometimes people's sincerity based on celebrity uh tends to turn me off a little bit you know right. and it's you're only and cool I get it. because you know this and that person yeah and i i get it i know i know where they're coming from and i don't think it's coming from a bad place but um the spot that i'm in sometimes it, it tends to i try to avoid it sometimes like yeah you don't connection wanna, you, with celebrity like as as though as if celebrity makes you more important you don't want to milk it yeah yeah, yeah. Exactly. and it's like it, and it get, you get far enough away it's like okay i did that 10 years ago am i still talking about and, and even like the working with shepherd thing because he's a fucking famous artist now and everybody right. knows who the fuck he That's is a huge thing. like it, it's a part of my history so i accept that and like and and i talk about it but there is a part in the back of my mind that's like 
Ah, oh, you're bringing this fucking thing up again. Like, why am I going to, like, am I riding somebody's coattails? Like, well, can I, I stand on my it up. I no, brought it yeah, up. I know, and I but, wanted to bring it up because I find that interesting. No, and of course. And it, and it's, again, it's a part of right. my story. So mm. it's like, it's something that it's going to stick but with me. But that's good that you're so self-observant. I do the same. Sometimes I say something, it's like, why do you say that, Chris? Do you say that to be cool? <laughs> to be yeah, like, yeah. You bring up that subject that's matter like, so you can bring up that topic. It's like, oh, yeah, I did that cool thing. That's it's the like, psychedelic mind, that? too. I feel like that type of thought process comes from that questioning that like psychedelics will make you do. Right. Because like, the, there's nowhere to hide. Yeah, yeah. You know? And like, you're only up here, like in a very intense way. Right. And so that sort of self reflection is kind of important to me. Like I I can't really lie to myself, you know? Like I was even thinking about it in here, like doing such a big project, like sometimes like, okay, where can I cut a corner? Like, and then if I do it, I'm like, all right, I know I cut that corner. Will anybody else know if I cut that corner? I know I did it. Fuck, I got to go back and uncut that corner. Right. So I, I, I make that question sometimes, too. I would ask a roommate, me like, would it matter if I just go and do this extra little thing or people still find it cool? And I think he says, like, I think we'd always find it cool. But if you do that little extra thing, we wouldn't know why that painting is extra little cool. Yeah. So yeah. might as well just go all the way, and that's what makes you special. Or, yeah. You know? And it's you being honest with yourself. You, and it's like you know the work needs something else. Mm -hmm. like you know it internally. You can feel it. And so you can make the choice whether to do that or not. Um, and I think that sort of – there's a freedom in that um, and a sort of self-responsibility, uh, you know, taking responsibility for the actions that you're about to make. Um, that that sticks with me mm -hmm. and so that's that I, I feel like that's that self-reflection could handcuff some people it could freeze people up from action um like by being too self um aware or insecure about what others might think or you know whatever but um yeah i i definitely There's think a fine line i feel between you know observing yourself and me like hey uh don't let the ego become the driver of yeah. yourself, like bringing up stories to make it look cool, for example. Yeah. But also, like, but you can tell a story if you want to, as long, you know, like, you don't want to self-doubt yourself to a point where you're crippled, as you say. Yeah. And I even find myself, like, uh, on that same note, like, I have a really hard time taking compliments. Like, it feels really weird. Um, and so it, it kind of falls into that same realm of, like, Oh, you did something famous with somebody famous or whatever. Um, but, you know, like. Why do you have difficulties accepting compliments? Because you don't like arrogance or because you have low self esteem or what's, what's blocking you just accepting how great you actually are? I don't know, to be honest with you. Um, I think probably know, being self-reflective enough to know your own flaws, um, know where you, where you sit in the spectrum of possibilities. Um, I don't know. I just find, a re I find it really awkward. I, I, as much as we've been talking right now, like talking about myself is not one of like, my great joys. Um, I like talking about concept and ideas and mm -hmm. like process and those sorts of things that's mm -hmm. great but it, there's i try to avoid the sort of pretentiousness that comes out of that yeah well um, it's not like you know we're at an art show and you just can't stop talking about yeah, yourself yeah. I'm, and, I'm making a I, I exclude this, this particular <laughs> context right like yeah. um, but yeah like what you're like yeah. if i was just like well guess what i did you yeah know? I, I, I can't uh, that shit drains me and i, yeah. I, I it's like the it. miami thing right. you know it's like constantly proving that you're good enough or like you're or, cool enough or like or spending a lot of time in la <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> like i just it's like i gotta go to the bathroom i'm sorry and <laughs> And you're yeah. just gonna like don't want to go back to that conversation. And I think I, I think there's maybe part of that like not accepting compliments is like not looking at myself like I've succeeded yet. And there is some detriment to that, but I feel like it also keeps me um, driven, like pushing forward. Like I know, like I've seen I've seen and experienced myself get better over the 22 years that I've been working professionally. Um, and I know that they're like, I know what that looks like. I know when I sucked 
and I know where I'm at now, and I know that where I'm at now is going to suck where, from where I was at 30 years from now or whatever, mm. you know? Um, so I think part of that plays in my mind. I'm like, well, you don't know. Like, you can tell me you're good or that I'm good, but you don't know that. Mm. Like, you, you can see that I'm good in the context of things now, but you don't know what I'm going to do in five years. Like, this guy, I, I could smash this maybe in five years. Mm -hmm. So I think that, like, there's something in staying humble, um, which humility and self-deprecation, or it's a thin it's a line thin in between line. those two. Yeah. Um, and arrogance and confidence. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I know I have a confidence in what I do, but I know that it's it's a challenge all the time. And I know that um, that it takes work. It's like I just had this conversation at a dinner the other night about someone was like, uh, like, you were born with this gift. And I was like, motherfucker, no. <laughs> like, maybe I was born with a type of brain that could work out these problems, but I had to work at this. I had to put hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of practice, years and years and years of not giving up and still being interested and like keeping my mind focused. And that's what's got me to where I am today, along with getting lucky, being at the right place at the right time, meeting the right people at the right time, um, just opening my mouth or keeping it shut some, at the right time, you know? Um, and that's really got me to where, to where I am. Um, and maybe it's, I'm not very complimentary towards other people. If I like something, I'll be like, that's really good, I like that. And that's about the extent of it. Um, so it might just be a personality trait yeah, too, yeah. you know. To each their own. Like uh, I hope you don't feel bad about it. No, no, I don't. Not at all. Um, but I, I definitely, I, I notice it in myself that if somebody compliments me about something, I'll self-deprecate like immediately after in mm. a joking way, not mm. like, "Well, I'm the fucking worst." Wham. Yeah. Be like, well, "Oh, well, did you see that little fuck up right there?" Like, yeah, well, it, that, you make fun of it. You yeah, know? yeah, you don't yeah. take it too serious. No, not at all. It's yeah. definitely in uh, when I'm self-deprecating. It's in mm. not in like a depressed way, but more so like a like a, a funny like way to like avoid that awkwardness of a problem. Yeah. And maybe it, other it is. It is weird. I understand. Yeah. it's the same with me. Like, um, I like to change the subject matter. I'll be like, "Well, what about you? What do you do?" <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. like because yeah. you know, a lot of people who talk to me are like fans, and I love them. Sure. But I don't want to talk about myself. I was like, "Oh yeah, I'm great." Uh, like, <laughs> yeah. okay, like cool. I, I can see you like my art. Awesome. We got yeah. that over with. Yeah, that's all I need. Now, <laughs> now let's talk about something interesting because sure. you know I just can't you know especially when there's many people a day if it's a festival or your own art show yeah you know you want to keep it interesting as you say you know there yeah. can't be the same conversation over and over again yeah right it, it gets boring for you shit right and you know it's fucking weird like it, bringing joe back up like going on tour with him and going to events and like i've traveled with him a bunch and i've seen how people act towards celebrity like somebody who's really fucking famous mm -hmm. and it's gross it's fucking maybe not gross it's almost disturbing it's there's a weirdness to it um like they want to suck some kind of their energy out of it or their specialness what, what i know i i think it's like people become different people when they're around somebody who is a celebrity like they act not themselves. Well, they're nervous, probably. But it's a, but that's the thing. It's like, what the fuck are you nervous about? Like these people are the same as you. They just happen to be a public figure or in entertainment, but they're not different than you. Like this, <laughs> actually, a video just popped up in my Facebook memories actually from a show here in San Diego that Joe and um, it was during Comic Con actually, which would have been would have started today um, mm. if it weren't for COVID. Um, oh, it's canceled this year? Yeah, again. Oh, wow. Well. Um, and we were in the, the green room at a comedy club downtown. And these guys came in who were like friends of the owner or like investors in the fucking club or something. And, the, and I, this is all on videotape. It actually is in one of Doug Benson's like Comic-Con documentary movies that he made. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, I smell the weed, bust it out. And we had been smoking in the bathroom so because the, the green room is right next to the stage and the crowd is right out there, so we, just to keep the, the smell down. And 
this guy he was clearly probably drunk, but was like trying to show off in front of the celebrity comedians and was like, oh, don't be a bitch. Is this it? And he grabs a beer bottle as if the beer bottle were a bong. And he grabs a lighter and he's like trying to light the bottle. Oh my God. As it a was joke? a Bud Light. As a joke? No, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Again, these are the weird fucking things that people do around celebrities for some fucking reason. Mm-hmm. And he goes to try to light it and drops the bottle. Ksh- Mm. In his green room, sprays beer everywhere. Oh my god. And everyone's like, what the fuck is wrong with you, dude? Like, <laughs> what are you doing? Why are you acting like a fucking weirdo? <laughs> and so, my point is, is that the, when people know somebody, but they don't, but that person doesn't know them, there's a weird dynamic that takes place that I find like really uncomfortable. And I like, I feel it. It's like, mm. I can, like, I could sense the feeling of that awkwardness in me. Mm. And it makes me uncomfortable. And I'm like, this, this stop it stop mm. it i mean sometimes no you can't need. help it i mm. yeah and it's you know it's, to it's eat, not, mm. every person has their own thing that they're going I, through i don't you think know? people would choose that i don't think somebody's like oh, i'm gonna be nervous like uh last week i met like a pro skater that i admire yeah he's from the 80s uh tony mcnewson he was champion in the 80s probably not that many people know him today but to me he means something yeah yeah, yeah. and yeah. we we're skating his ball and I was just so nervous when I'm talking to him. And I'm like, Chris, you're cool too. Quit being so nervous. <laughs> yeah. You're going to think you're a dork. But, I, <laughs> but I couldn't help it. As I said that out loud, I, like I remembered, I, I met Mike D of the Beastie Boys at mm-hmm. a party once. And mm-hmm. I was the same thing. I was super fucking nervous. Whatever I said was weird. He had like had a snowboard injury and like had hurt his shoulder at some point before that. And I was like, I tapped him on the shoulder. And I was like, oh, how no. did you do that? <laughs> like, just like, and that's somebody who I, you know, yeah. looked up to as a kid. Right. And so, yeah, I guess but, like, I, I get it. But too. I bet the second time you'll hang out with him. Oh, I would, ke- now I would keep it super fucking cool. Yeah. But, but at, now you've trained. I was, I was <laughs> drunk. And I was, you know, 21 at a, like, Hollywood fucking party. And, like, I was like, holy shit, that's Mike D. I'm going to go and fucking talk to him. Mm-hmm. And I, I wish I hadn't. I, 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 <laughs> I always avoid it. When I see famous people, it's like, ah, oh, I'd love to talk to him, but I don't want to disturb him. And I yeah. usually stay away. But then that happens to me, like, with my own uh, fans or people who look up to me, like, They'll write me later, be like, "Oh, I saw you at this festival, but they want to disturb you." It's like, yeah. "Oh, I would have loved to talk to you." Yeah, like, just say you know, hi. It's, it's but that's the thing; you can act like a normal person. And I think, mm-hmm. like meeting Joe and doing those, like being in those environments, I just acted like everybody else. Like I just kept it fucking cool, um, and you know that goes a, a long, a long way, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Well, that's so interesting. Um, so you said that the Comic Con was canceled by COVID. Like, has this area of the states, Southern California, been very affected in their rules? Like, has your career been kind of like blocked by the COVID um, um, year well, and a half we just went through? I mean, day to day has been exactly the same for somebody like me. Um, my show that I, I had a solo show that literally opened the week everything got locked down. Okay. Um, so that got pushed back a little ways and then the opening was not like a big party. It was like by reservation only. There was like four to five people in the gallery at a time. Um, so what, that what was What period a, was that? It was literally the first, it was like the, March, 2020. Yeah. It was within that first week of shutdown. Okay. Um, and so we put, well, actually my show was supposed to be that first week and then it got pushed back a month. Because we were like, okay, well, let's wait it out and see. And I, I think it got, and got pushed back. T- maybe it was like mid-June. So that chunk between May and June, there was some pushback. And, um, so it's cool. It still happened. Still happened. And the work sold. Like it, What I found was like people who actually were coming out to see the work were the ones who came out. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Versus like the people coming out for a party, which like no, no dig on them. Like, it's Quality fun to come quantity. and hang out. Yeah. So it ended up being really good. Um, and I ended up doing a bunch of zine projects over the, the year mm-hmm. um, where I did collaborations with artist friends when we would do a hand-drawn zine. Like I would paint, draw half of it, give it to them. They'd fill in the other pages. Mm. We'd auction off the original and then sell prints. Um, so those did really well. Um, had some commissions over the, the time frame. So, I mean, as artists, our, our, 
our process is pretty, you know, isolated already. Right. Like I'm we're used always, to it. We're, already, I need it. we're always in quarantine. Yeah, I fucking need it. I need to be by myself a chunk of the day to feel sane, like to go over all the thoughts in my mind to to deal with what I need to deal with. Like it's it's a necessity for me. It's like a drug almost. Like I I need solitary time. But that but I also need community time too. I need time with my people. Um, but yeah, so like for me, it was no problem. Not, but and I feel bad for people who don't have something that they can do that isn't just looking at their fucking phone to, you know, bide their time to entertain themselves. I've been entertaining myself since I was a little fucking kid. So a part of this art making process is just that, you know, it's, oh, well, this is fun for me to do. So I'm going to do it. Time flies by, you know. Like, the meditative process of making art is, like, time stands still. Body functions slow down. Like, it's it's a bizarre thing that, that occurs. And for people who don't have that in whatever form, um, you know, whether you go fucking running or lift weights or kick a soccer ball, whatever it is, like, and, you know, maybe some people couldn't even do that stuff, but to have something that I could sit, I could sit down and draw all day and be fine, and look my head up and the sun's going down and, you know, feel just fine. Find your so, happiness there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's like, for us, I don't think there was much of a, a big difference. Mm -hmm. um, I know, like, my favorite bar got shut down because they couldn't stay open, and that sucks. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like... I guess that was the biggest thing is like that type of industry, which is, you know, a lot of times privately owned, private businesses, like like the bar, it was called Bar Pink in, um, in North Park, my favorite place to go. And it was run by like three couples who all put their, saved their money, put it together and opened up this bar and had it there for, you know, 15 years or whatever. Mm. Ended up having to sell the space because they, they couldn't stay open. Well... We're coming to the end of our show, Mike. <laughs> Thank you so much yeah. for uh, talking uh, to me and, you know, catching up. It's been so fun. Uh, that's one of the things that I like about this podcast once again. It just gives me an excuse to be like, yo, where's, uh, where's Mike at? And let's see what he's up to. Yeah. And then yeah. I catch you in, in, in the middle of your creative habitat. Um, would you have some, like, you know, words of wisdom or final thoughts about anything you'd like to finish off this conversation um yeah i mean I, my hope is always that like young artists are listening to these sorts of things and trying to get a grasp on on how this shit works and i think the biggest thing is to just keep your nose to the grindstone and like keep working like keep pushing what you do and i mean as silly as it is like if you do the work, like opportunities arise, opportunities will fall into your lap. And, you know, maybe I'm just a lucky motherfucker, but I'm living proof that like, if you stick to the work and you really love it, like if you're going to like, maybe like what you're saying about, um, Montreal and like people like that, there's a zillion fucking artists and, you know, looking at Instagram, there's a zillion fucking artists. Like everyone calls themselves a fucking artist. Um, you really got to love this shit. Like, it has to be mm -hmm. in you. Right. Like, you if you want to make it, like, and, you know, maybe there's, like, flash-in-the-pan cases of people who are like, oh, I did this, and I'm popular, I'm an influencer, and I make art, and I sell it, or whatever. But, like, if you want to be an artist, like, know that it's, like, in you. It's, like, a part of you. It's, like, it's a necessity. There's, it's like, no need. option. There's no other option. Yeah. There's no other option, and you give up everything. If you're willing to give up everything to follow this path, then go for it a hundred percent. And if you just like making things on the side, just do that too. Like Ooh. there's no fucking rules, but, um, just like stay on the grind and keep pushing your work. Don't settle. Like keep trying to like outdo yourself. Like you should always be in a battle with yourself to like, you know, as if you were the dragon that you need to slay, like you need to continue to get, get better and get better. And, I don't know, be fucking nice to each other, you mm. know? Like, <laughs> it's a short time on this planet, you Why know? Not? Like, maybe kinda, think a little bit differently. Don't be so selfish. Like We're kind of sucking at it lately. 
<laughs> yeah. We're adaptable little apes, so like <laughs> we can make changes when necessity calls. Yeah. Um I have some fun. Hell yeah. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Mike. Of course, I brother. love you, brother. I love you too. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem. Well, both my cameras just died, so I'm going to say goodbye to oh. this camera. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you for watching to another week of Chris Dyer's Creative Friends. I hope you had fun with this conversation. Please make sure to like, subscribe, comment, share, all that awesome things. And I'll see you next time. Blessings. Woo. Peace. Today I am in Las Vegas, Nevada, and I am chilling at the place of my friend Joseph Hefs. You don't just take psychedelics, you have to have balls. Like you're you're not escaping, you're going within, right? You know what I mean? I think it's the opposite. Like you're it's gonna show you things that you don't wanna see. It's gonna help you see right. the things that you lie to yourself about. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I, I did that gangster shit for wannabe gangster stuff. And I tell gang, like, sometimes you gotta be scared of the wannabes more because we have more to prove. I had to prove I was down and, and I did things that still haunt me today. Luckily, I never killed anybody, but I've shot at people and I've been shot at and I've done things that um, I'm not proud of. Wow. But it, uh, it built character once I got into tattooing. So make sure to subscribe, like, and everything else. Big thanks, and see you next week. Peace.